Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay, for a warm welcome. Um, can I just say that it's absolutely fantastic to be presenting in my home state, Queensland. Um, you know, being a Queenslander, it's always a pleasure. Um, and it's great to see such a great turnout today. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank all the people that have been involved in organising this event. So, um, Lindsay at PK, Gary Roberts, Griffith Uni, and also um, the funding partners, um, Life Without Barriers and Key Assets have also been part of this project. So I'm very excited about the launch today. All right, so I'm um, gonna take you on a little bit of a journey. Hold on, if I can get there. Yeah, so that's a presentation outline. Um, I, you'll be with me for, until about 11. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, it is a lot, but I guess to start the story or start the journey, it's really important to give you a bit of a background about what's led to the launch of this practice guide and where we've come from and, and what, why is it so important that we're actually um, talking about culture and talking about culturally sensitive practice today. So. Lindsay uh, gave a bit of an introduction. So my name's Jatinda Kaur. Um, I'm the director of JK Diversity Consultants. Um, uh, it's an independent entity um, established in 2011. Do lots of different things, do policy, advocacy. I'm a social worker, um, do evaluation, deliver training. I think being an independent entity also gives me a very unique position to actually put forward um, some of the issues without um, uh, without having to be hindered by um, government or gag clauses. So what you'll see today is actually the truth and the facts. Um, you know, I'm not going to um, gloss them over. Um, that's not my intention. But what I do want to do is challenge some of the thinking and challenge some of the, the notions of people's understandings and perceptions and, and what their viewpoints are. So you've all made a commitment here to, um, you know, understand about culture and understand about what is what it is to be a culturally sensitive practitioner. Um, that will mean about being challenging yourself and about what you understand what culture is. So, first and foremost, um, uh, who am I? I guess um, I'm a Sikh, so I come with a spiritual framework. And I don't, and I talk about that because I think that's really important about identity. So the practice guide will talk about identity. And I guess what's led me to this journey has been about that framework, that spiritual framework about equality. So this quote that I've used here is um, from our Holy Scriptures, um, from our 10th Guru, so Guru Gobind Singh, which says, recognize the human race as one. So if we start that as a platform, that we are all equal. There is no difference. So whether you are black, white, Aboriginal, migrant, refugee, Pacific Islander, Indian, Vietnamese, we are all equal. And we are all have an equal say in a progressive democracy. And so what that means is, then how do we understand equality? How do we understand social inclusion? How do we understand fairness and a cohesive society? cohesive society, you know, where we understand what are the different factors that are impacting on particular marginalised community groups. Are there structural barriers? Are there system barriers? Are there institutions that may have racist practices? You know, maybe not intentionally, but it's about understanding, well, you know, if all the workers are from a, a particular background, so Anglo-Australian, or from a white privileged perspective, what does that mean around their intervention when they're working with clients from a diverse background? What's their understanding about their story and their journey and when you're working with diverse clients? First and foremost, I would like to, as Lindsay has done, acknowledge the Aboriginal elders past and present and custodians of land and history. I want you to just uh, spend a few minutes understanding the image that I've presented there. So for those who can't see or read the wording, it actually depicts what it must have been like for the First Nations of this uh, Aboriginal people of this land and how they would have seen Captain Cook when he landed on the shores. 
So the caption is, I'm so sick of these bloody boat people. They come to our country, disrespect our way of life, take our jobs, take our land, disrespect our laws, form criminal gangs, deal drugs to our kids. They don't assimilate into our communities and they don't even bother trying to learn our language. Now, how many times have you guys heard that from the government of the day or former day? It is an ideology. It is a perspective. It is also about privilege. And it is also the notion of how do we create the otherness within ourselves. So if we go to the first premise that we are all equal, but in practice, we are not all treated as equals. So at the moment, this, over the last probably five or six months, I've been doing a lot of work in the Cape York and Aboriginal communities. And I guess my experience in working with migrant refugee communities has enhanced my understanding of working with Aboriginal communities and understanding their culture, understanding their traditions, the language, and also the intergenerational trauma that comes with that of dislocation of culture and language. The same learnings can be applied when you're working with migrant and refugee communities. So, we do live in a multicultural Australia. That's a reality. The census in 2011 identified that, showed that we have hard stats. You know, one in four Australians are born overseas. 5.3 million people, you know, out of the 21.5 million. In Sydney, Melbourne and Perth, you have 80% of the population that is born overseas. And in Queensland, 20% of the population is born overseas. And we also have the second largest New Zealand migrant population, which uh, a large proportion of them are from Pacific Islander backgrounds, so whether they're Samoan, Maori, Tongan, um, and Fijian. You know, we also have a very large migration program. So we have a, la a lot of migrants coming, settling in Australia under the skilled stream and under the family stream, as well as the refugee humanitarian program. So if people turn around and say, oh, we don't have cultural diversity, sorry, we have the cultural diversity, okay? We live in a multicultural society. It's a matter of how do we change our perspective to actually be inclusive of other cultures. Australia has also ratified seven UN human rights treaties, and two are relevant to the discussion that we're having today. So the first one is the UN Conventions on the Rights of the Child, the UN CROC, which was ratified in 1991. Now, when I've done my research I've, and I've looked at the UN CROC, there are three articles of the UN Convention which are relevant to this topic today. And the first one is Article 19, which is the protection of a chi any child in Australia from child abuse and neglect. <coughs> Article 14 talks about the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Article 30 is a right to practice the own religion and culture for indigenous and minority children. Critical part, indigenous and minority children. Okay, so since 1991, you know, each state and territory has ratified the UN CROC into its state-based legislation. So in Queensland, that would be in the Child Protection Act. So as part of the Child Protection Act, you have the principles of the Act, which include those provisions. The second treaty that is relevant to this discussion today is the UN International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which was ratified in Australia in 1975 which is the Racial Discrimination Act. So this legislation covers what makes direct and indirect discrimination on the grounds of face, colour and ethnic origin and makes it unlawful. So in Queensland, you have the Anti-Discrimination Act. So, you know, it was a huge relief to both the Indigenous and multicultural communities when Section 18C was not repealed. You know, so we have a certain government agenda that was wanting to water down those provisions which have served Australia very well for the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but those protections are there for a reason. And what happens is when you have people who don't understand um, what racism looks like, 
and the impact of racism, they're coming from a place of a position of privilege. So I, for myself, I have experienced racism and I know what it looks like, I know what it feels like. But when you've got people who are in positions of power, you know, and who have no notion of understanding what racism is like, they will then move forward with a, a political ideology that is not in line with community expectations. So it's great to see that, I think it was the highest amount of submissions they received, 5,000 submissions from across Australia. The Anti-Discrimination Commission has also outlined that indirect discrimination can occur when information is only provided in English and clients who cannot speak English proficiently will be treated unfairly and be disadvantaged. So we've got to understand what is direct discrimination and what is indirect discrimination as well. So it's one thing to say, okay, well, we're not you know, discriminating you based on your colour, your ethnic, your origin. But if everything that you provide to your clients is in English and your client cannot speak English, you're actually indirectly discriminating your clients. So really you have to reflect on what is your duty and obligation and how do you ensure that you're using interpreters and how do you ensure that you are communicating the message that you need to communicate um, to ensure that you get a good outcome. So in Queensland, we have the language service policy, which stipulates that all staff have an obligation to provide and use interpreters wherever they feel a client um, cannot speak English. Now, how that is implemented is variable. So, uh, you know, in a former life, I did work in the, the bureaucracy in state governments. So I know working in, in multicultural affairs, which is now called Cultural Diversity Queensland, you know, we tried really hard to monitor the progress of how departments were reporting on their interpreter exped expenditure and how often they were using interpreters or translation services. My challenge has been, certainly I know from child protection and the child and family welfare sector, that when investigations occur, I can bet you top dollar, they don't necessarily use interpreters at that point. At that critical point when you're doing an investigation and an assessment, if you're not using an interpreter, how do you know that your, de your decision making is accurate? How do you ensure that you've got the, all the full information that you need to have? And yet you might go down a whole path of actually applying for a, you know, a temporary order, child protection order, or a domestic violence order without fully knowing what's gone on with that family. So that's why I'm talking about that. National data. So in developing the practice guide, I wanted to have a look at well, what, you know, how many children and young people are in Australia? What, what is the data out there? So we have 5.0 million children in Australia, 1.5 million in their infancy, 2.2 million in primary school, 1.4 million adolescents from age 13 to 17. Now across Australia, we have 39,621 children and young people in out-of-home care of which we know, because departments collect that data, 13,299 are from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. So we know how many are in the system, and we also know how many identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. What we don't know, and this is why I've used the word hidden or invisible, is the number of children and young people that identify from a culturally and linguistically diverse background or are from a refugee background. It's unknown. No one's bothered to capture the data. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. I've been trying to advocate it for the last eight years and still I find departments, state and territories uh, across Australia, there's the, that re reluctance that we, you know, we don't really need to capture it because you know what will happen if we actually start to capture it, we might actually have to do something. So the UN committee, which actually monitors Australia's progress on how it actually implements the UN conventions on the rights of the child, provided recommendations back in 2012, which actually said that the Australian government needs to improve its data collection, particularly around ethnicity, language and country of origin of children and young people. In 2013, we had the appointment of the National Children's Commissioner, Megan Mitchell, 
Now, her primary role and function is going to be about how Australia, across all the state and territories, monitors um, and, and implements the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So she released a report called the Children's Report 2013, and I would encourage you to look at that. And one of her recommendations in there is about the real importance of collecting data. Why is data important? The lack of data on CALD and refugee children and young people in the child protection system has a direct impact on understanding whether there's an under-representation or an over-representation. <coughs> so we've only come to a point in 2014 that we actually have closed the gap initiative. We have that because we have hard data. We know for a fact that the disparities between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Anglo-Australians is huge. And that's why we have a concerted effort across all state and territories to close the gap. Now, when you don't have data, they're invisible. They don't exist. So that's why it's really important. And then when you don't know whether there's an under-reporting or an over-representation, that also means that you don't know what's coming in and what's in the system and you don't know how you're well supporting those children that are coming into the system. It also means that departments aren't developing policy or practice guidelines for their frontline staff or for practitioners, whether you're a funded NGO or a child protection worker, and how to meet that client group's needs. You're not actually looking at placement options and whether they're being culturally matched, culturally appropriate placements. And how do you maintain culture or support the child that is from a CALD or a refugee background in out-of-home care? So I guess what's been the motivating factor for me and what's kept me driven and, and on this journey since 2006, 2007 has been that there has been a significant gap in child protection policy framework in meeting the needs of CALD and refugee communities. So this is governments. This is not just Queensland government. This is all state and territory governments. So both at state and federal level, you have multicultural policy frameworks which aim to address the needs of migrant refugee families, but that knowledge from the multicultural policy has not necessarily been incorporated into the child and family welfare policy framework or the child protection system or the out-of-home care system. It's like those two different policy arenas aren't talking to each other. And also you have two different ministers, two different departments. As you know, in any type of context, when you have two different ideologies, they're not necessarily you know, communicating and embedding that practice. So that's why we have a significant gap. When I talked about data, it's not only in child protection that we don't have data. I've looked at youth justice data. We don't actually have data for that either. So we know how many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are juvenile offending. We don't know the proportion of CALD or refugee young people that are juvenile offenders. And so there's huge disparities in a number of policy arenas, not just in child protection. So I've alluded, yes, I come from frontline practice in a former life. Um, that's why I'm still passionate about child protection practice. I have done the hard yards. I worked in child protection, worked in child safety, worked in there about for three years um, as a frontline worker. So I've done the whole gamut, investigation assessment, intervention with parental agreement, short term, long term, the whole suite of it. So in 2006, um, you know, I was fortunate enough that when I was working in the department, um, I was given permission, I was doing my master's research, uh, master's degree at that time, and was given ethical clearance to actually conduct a research study while I was still working in the department. So that research study that I did was I actually um, surveyed uh, 66 frontline investigation and assessment workers across 10 child safety service centres southeast Queensland. And what I explored was um, cultural competence in child protection. So I critically asked them the questions around, you know, what's their training, what's their education, how often do they use interpreters, how do they support their children and young people from diverse backgrounds in out-of-home care placements. So it was the first research study conducted in Australia that actually looked at 
cultural competence and child protection. So it was a survey, a cross-cultural child protection survey. Um, it was broken down into six sections. So you had, you know, asked around, uh, uh, explored what their education, their training was, uh, looked at what the tra type of training the department provided, looked at, you know, what their understanding was around cultural competence or cultural sensitive practice, looked at placement. So explored all of that information. And it was purposive samples, so I was really interested in looking at, well, how do investigation and assessment workers actually deal with migrant refugee families? So having worked in frontline um, child protection work, I know when I first joined the department, and even through my training and practice, the spectrum was huge. So I know when I worked in one office, they would remove children left, right and centre, and then another office they wouldn't remove and it would be for the same harm type. So the, 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 the variance in practice was huge. And I couldn't get my head around thinking, what's going on? Like, why is it that for some families they're removing at such high rates and for others they're not? And, the, and, and when I tried to unpack it, it was da tied down to the fact that the practitioners weren't skilled enough. They didn't have a good understanding about working with cross-culturals and understanding what were the different factors that were bringing those families to the system. So what did the research identify? So it was, the research was quite significant that it identified clearly that frontline child protection workers did not receive any training that helped them to work with clients from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. And they actually had to wait 12 months before they got the training. So that was actually a statistical significant finding. And despite them actually having um, seen some clients from diverse backgrounds um, more than once a week, so they were seeing a high proportion of clients but they weren't being supported by the department through training or policy or practice guidelines. So the study identified key concerns in the provision of child family welfare practice when working with families from CAL backgrounds within the Australian context. So there's been two um, journal articles that were published from that paper. So when I looked at the qualitative uh, findings of the paper, you know, and I really wanted to unpack, well, what was the frontline workers understanding around what is culturally sensitive practice in child protection? And a lot of them were able to identify some critical skills that they believed that, front, you know, child protection workers needed to have. And these cross-cultural skills were respectful engagement with culturally diverse families, the use of interpreters, ascertaining cultural supports within the community, so really trying to look at connecting with community, linking with cultural liaison officers, referral for appropriate services, kinship or culturally matched placements. So this is, you know, going back a good couple of years, but these are some really critical skills that are relevant today because those, those findings have not yet changed practice. So as the journey has progressed, um, sometimes you, you keep on pushing the mantra, sometimes you take a back step. Um, in 2012, um, I was fortunate enough to get some funding from federal government to launch this report, which is called Culturally Diversity in Child Protection. And this is the first Australian literature review, and I reviewed all of the published research in Australia, as well as unpublished research. So I guess being passionate and, um, uh, you know, about this topic and in, and in this area, I was really keen to also uh, explore what was um, already in practice, you know, some of the unpublished reports that I knew existed out there. So this report consolidated all of the research at that point. And it provided a baseline of the knowledge because nothing like this existed. And it's available online. Now, this was published in 2012, and it's probably been cited in about over 20 publications. Um, it's had an impact on uh, certainly in two child protection inquiries, um, Queensland and in Victoria, and in the national framework. Interesting also, um, I've seen that it's been used um, not only in Australia, but also in the UK. So it's actually listed for the National Health Service website and the social worker, social care website as a critical resource. 
So not to blow my own trumpet, but um, it's a seminal piece of work that actually consolidates the evidence base about how to work effectively, culturally sensitively, with migrant and refugee families with the interface of child protection and out-of-home care sector. So in this report, I actually put forward seven recommendations to all state and territory governments, which I will talk about further down. But some of the key messages from this research literature review was that there's a real need to collect data on CALD and refugee communities. There's a need to develop culturally responsive service delivery specific to CALD and refugee communities. There's a need to develop community education and awareness campaigns targeting CALD and refugee communities. Develop cultural competence training for frontline child protection workers or workers who are working employed in the funded NGO sector, whether you're a family support worker, you're a working out of home care, kinship or foster care agency. And looking at culturally responsive placement options for child and refugee children in, in out of home care. So this is what I've come up with. So this is a bit of a, a, a mind map, the emerging framework in understanding how child maltreatment occurs in migrant and refugee communities. So throughout the presentations, I'm not going to talk too much about Dr. Pooja Swaraka's research because she's going to be presenting about that and also QPAST are going to talk about refugee communities. But I have found that this framework is a really useful framework to understand how you need to work differently. So if we look at the green circle, there are a number of factors that practitioners need to be aware of that is tied into the pre-migration journey to Australia which is understanding whether your client has actually been in a refugee camp or in a transit camp, or actually whether they're from a third world developing country. Now, with the Australian's migration program, we actually have a large intake that comes from countries like India and China and from the Asia Pacific region, who actually have no access to settlement support service. So they actually get no orientation about what are the Australian laws, what are the expectations, their understanding around what is domestic violence, what is child protection, what's sexual assault, what's rape, they get no orientation. And they can also hit the system because there's no, there's no primary prevention happening. Then you look at the pink circle, which is the resettlement in Australia. So the critical factors that can bring families to the attention of authorities is around access to services. Who is eligible to child and family welfare services? Who's in and who's out? So we talk about social inclusion. We also need to look at who's socially excluded. You know, asylum seekers, New Zealand migrants that are on the Trans-Tasman Treaty, you know, on certain uh, special category visas, you know, unaccompanied minors. There are a number of people that, who live in Australia who cannot access services. Language barriers. Now, Australia is an Anglophone country. If you cannot speak English, you cannot navigate the system. I'm fairly lucky. You know, I was born in the UK. I'm brought up with a British education. I live here. I can speak English. I can navigate the system. But if I'm from a country, you know, that I speak multiple languages and I'm trying to learn English or I don't know how to re un read English or speak English, you're going to struggle. And if you've got practitioners that are not using interpreters, don't have translated material, obviously things are going to go wrong. Food and accommodation. That ties into Maslow's need hierarchy. Okay? There are some basic needs. As human beings, we all have food, shelter, security, safety. Okay? So you always got to look at how are those basic needs met before you even start to address drugs and alcohol, domestic violence, family functioning, well-being. And the treatment by the host country. And that really ties into, well, are we an inclusive society? Do we have practitioners who are curious and respectful of different cultures? Or do we have practitioners who hold on to stereotypes and biases and actually might have some preconceived judgments and, and, and make stereotypes. So when I say that, 
I've worked with practitioners who have very strong beliefs and ideologies about certain community groups. And they will go with that assumption, no, they are abusive, we have to remove because that's their culture. So they will label the culture as abusive without any understanding, without any conversation, without any sort of unpacking what that means. So for me, that's tied into if you're working in an institution that might be inherently racist and you might not even know it. So the whole notion of white Australia and privilege. How do we actually understand the other? And it's about having a cultural lens, a cultural perspective, and actually really trying to think about how do you put yourself in another person's shoes? That then leads into the blue circle, child maltreatment. That's where things go wrong. You know, that's where things happen. So that's where you get physical violence, you get emotional you know, neglect, you get children that, who, whose basic needs are not being met, and you get um, sexual abuse. But it's in that circle. So where those three circles intersect, that's where your clients are going to be coming into the system. And that's where practitioners really need to know and understand what are the multiple factors that are impacting on your clients. What is their journey? journey? What is their story? You know, how, do, how best can I support them? You know, there's no use having a child protection system if you have nothing to do with prevention. So just as we think about cancer, okay, skin cancer, we, have, we ha used to have high rates of skin cancer. Now, had they not brought in a prevention strategy of using sunscreen, sunblock, protecting yourself, the rates of cancer would have continued onto the huge trajectory. But now we've managed to sort of slide that. We need to think of child protection in that same way. We need to look at how do we do prevention, primary prevention as well as secondary intervention. How do we upskill our families? How do we educate? How do we empower them? So that we're not actually, our first step is not removing, we're actually helping them. I know I'm challenging you all today, so I can see that with the, with the looks on the faces. All right, what we know. So the research literature review, you know, identified some critical things. You know, what do we know? We know that risk factors common to all families are prevalent. So domestic and family violence, substance abuse, mental illness. But families that are from a CALD or refugee background face a number of unique risk factors and challenges which may lead them to the involvement of child protection. Both CALD and refugee communities would benefit from early intervention and prevention strategies, particularly on accepting parenting practices around physical discipline. So the literature review identified that physical discipline or corporal punishment was one of the main harm types bringing both CALD and refugee families to the system. So if we haven't educated our families or told them, in Australia, you can't smack your child, or you're not allowed, or this is what will happen if you use an implement, then obviously they're going to be reported to the system. So we actually haven't done enough to try and educate and raise awareness around what are the accepted parenting norms in Australia. A lot of parents don't know the role of child protection. It's a completely foreign concept. You've got to understand, depending on where they've come from, a child protection system may not exist. So the whole notion of a government system coming in and intervening in the family space is foreign. Okay, it's an alien concept and it's quite traumatic because if you think about it, if they come from countries where the government has been the persecutor um, and has tortured them or, you know, and they've had that trauma and fear of government, they're not going to want to talk to you, just as with police officers or child protection workers. There's a real need to, you know, change community awareness pro programs so that they are culturally tailored so that they understand what are the Australian laws, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's child protection, whether it's around forced child marriages or sexual abuse. There's a need, absolute need, for frontline child protection workers to develop cultural competency. Now, the reason why I emphasise that, double emphasise that, is that my bugbear for the last eight years has been that every time I've dealt with departmental bureaucrats, there is, there is an inherent reluctance to upskill and train and build capacity for frontline workers. 
your frontline child protection workers are the critical decision makers. Now you need to invest in them. Okay? And I, maybe I'm talking to the preacher or the converted here. But if you don't invest in your frontline workers, you will only achieve poor outcomes. You invest in your frontline workers, you give them the best training, you give them the best practice guidelines, best supervision, you will achieve the outcomes that you're wanting to achieve. Now, if we're in Queensland, we've got more 8,000 children in out-of-home care, and maybe 4,000, I think the trajectory is about 4,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Out of the remainder 4,000, how many of them are from a CALD or refugee background? We don't know. It's not hard. It will take a simple directive from a minister or director general to mandate all frontline workers, you need to collect data as of this date. It's not hard. I've used ICMS. I know how the system works. It's not rocket science. To click on a, a cultural diversity category and put that in. It's not hard to ask all the funded NGOs who are providing out-of-home care support services, what's the proportion of your placements from a CALD or refugee background? That's not hard. And that's not rocket science. We collect all this data, yet we don't use it when we need to use it, for the things that we need to use it. Now, if we're wanting to truly change the system and reduce the trajectory of children coming into care, we need to look at what's our workforce, what's our system, and upskilling and training is, is critical to that. So if we have an absolutely fantastic practitioner who has the best training and is well supervised, you will achieve those outcomes. And the mixed race heritage children, they really struggle in the system too. We're not even, we haven't even started in understanding mixed race heritage um, children, and that's just across the board, whether in child and family welfare. So we're, we're, let alone we're struggling with just Anglo-Australian and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, you can forget mixed race because that's just a whole, that's way too confusing. What we don't know, all right, the prevalence of child abuse and neglect amongst both CALD and refugee communities, and I think I've already emphasised this point, it's absolutely critical. We need to know this. We're in 2014. You know, we're smart, intelligent people, and as a progressive society, if you have a, a certain proportion, one in four Australians that are not being counted in critical statistics and figures, that says something. That says something about a system, that says something about a government, about not being inclusive of a certain population group. We don't know what the placement needs of Calden refugee children or unaccompanied minors in out-of-home care. There's been no research. There is no evidence. We have no idea. And we don't know what are the early intervention and prevention strategies that could work effectively. I, you know, when I did the literature review, I couldn't find many, or if none, early intervention prevention strategies for culturally diverse communities. All right, seven recommendations that were put forward in, in this lit review. And the first one was around the national framework. So when I launched this, this is when the second action plan was being developed, and they did include some of the um, recommendations in the Second Action Plan. Through COAG, in each state and territory, they, it was assumed there was a commitment to collect data, uh, but I was disappointed when the Child Protection Report that was launched earlier this year did, still did not include any category for CALD or refugee children in out-of-home care, so we still haven't got there yet, so there's a critical gap. Departments to incorporate provisions for child or refugee communities in the child protection policy, legislation, and practice guidelines. Look, slowly that is changing. Um, certainly New South Wales have been the leading state, um, and that's historically for a number of different reasons. They're a larger state. They have about 18,000 children and young people in care. Um, and Pooja Swaraka will talk a lot more about uh, her research in New South Wales about that. Recommendation four. Departments to develop a communication strategies for CALD and refugee families. What is child protection? Early intervention prevention awareness. You know, what is child abuse? You know, what's accepting parenting practices? So at this point in time, we actually don't have that information. Um, one of the projects, I'll, I mean, I'm very excited to launch this practice guide, but I will be launching another one in, in next month which is a practice guide um, with uh, an NGO in Victoria, which is looking at parenting in a new culture. 
which is very much a primary prevention focus. And this is looking at migrant and refugee families and what it means to actually parent in a new culture, in a new Australian culture. So, so that'll be an exciting space to be looking at primary prevention and community education for newly arrived families. So this recommendation is a critical one. You know, it's one thing to deflect responsibility. Well, you know, we're funding the NGO sector now. We're moving towards secondary intervention. The tertiary system still has a critical role to play. So you still have child protection system. So departments, so whether you're in Queensland or you know, New South Wales or Victoria, you still need to be culturally responsive. And that's about looking at your service model to actually making sure that your service model is inclusive of CALD and refugee families. And that's really looking at your recruitment, retention of diverse staff, looking at bicultural staff, looking at how you're using interpreters or translation material, looking at training, you know, what type of training you're giving your workers, recruitment strategies for fostering kinship carers, looking at practice guidelines, looking at cultural support plans. It's not rocket science, it's just best practice. Looking at culturally sensitive considerations. So if we have um, structured decision making in Queensland and we have considerations for working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, where are the cultural considerations for CALD and refugee families in the system? And now if we're going to invest $3 million in a new practice framework, where is the understanding about how do we actually meet the needs of CALD and refugee families and incorporate that understanding about culturally sensitive practice into a new practice framework and a risk assessment tool. You know, and it's about looking at how we're building the sector, whether you're in child protection or whether you're in the NGO funded service. All right, I think I've talked a little bit about that. So I've done quite a bit of advocacy, you know, whether it's been at state and federal level. So I was invited. Um, to present my research to the Victorian Child Protection Inquiry and actually went through the sitting process. Um, and, and that was a, a, a unique experience and quite a valuable experience. Um, and they used the policy submission that I presented um, into Chapter 13 and we got three recommendations out of that for the Victorian Child Protection Inquiry back in 2011. And for the Queensland Child Protection Inquiry, I, I actually prepared three submissions on my own. One of them was around cultural competence in child protection. You can access that online. Um, and two of the other were, others were on other issues. Um, we do have, well, it's not all despair in Queensland, we do have one recommendation. I think the challenge in Queensland was that because the inquiry was run by a judicial officer, and I think it's about if you're only coming in from a legal perspective, your lens and your experience and viewpoint will be driven from a judicial perspective. Um, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to input into that, nor was I asked for it. They did seek, they did get the, these reports, um, and I always made sure that my, my, anything that I have prepared is available online. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for making um, evidence base available for everyone, not just in the academic world. So we do have one recommendation, uh, which is recommendation 7.6, which, um, as everyone knows, the Queensland government has accepted all the recommendations, but this one is particularly around cultural diversity and uh, refugee families. So the department is you know, required to, at a local level, to really look at how uh, mapping some of that culture and linguistically communities, engaging, consulting, developing cultural support plans, training, kinship, NGO sector. So all of the recommendations that I've already talked about, that's it in there. So, but the, the, the key will be how that is implemented in practice. So it's all well and good to have put all this time and effort to go through a child protection inquiry, have the recommendations. The critical factor will be the implementation and the 10 year roadmap. So, what does the research tell us? There has been no Australian research examining practices, policies that address the needs of other or ethnic minority groups in out-of-home care. And, and identified in 2007, but then again in the National Research Audit. I'm quoting my dear colleague, Pooja Swarika here. So when she did her research literature review, the needs of child and children in child protection is 
is limited, and, and, and that's on the international scale as well. So not only in Australia we have very limited research, but on, a, on, in, on the international um, context there is very limited research as well. There's been a few smaller studies which are relevant because it's always good to look at, okay, well, what, what's happened in a smaller scale? So New South Wales, as I alluded before, being a larger state and being a very diverse state, um, they've had to tackle these issues over a longer period um, and have done a lot of exploratory um, studies. So they've looked at um, particularly culturally matched placements and uh, looking at how to build the sector knowledge. The, so looking at cultural identity for children and young people, so in Moss's study that found that children that were from a uh, mixed race or interracial background, they displayed uh, issues around identity confusion and self-esteem issues. The lit review around unaccompanied minors has found that there's been limited research and awareness about the needs and experiences of unaccompanied minors in out-of-home care. Now, uh, unaccompanied minors is a moving feast, particularly with the current um, Abbott government and the changes in policies and frameworks. So, you know, you've got a number of unaccompanied minors that are still in offshore detention, that are not being released or still kept. And so we've got to actually, the Australian Human Rights Commission have got a, an inquiry into children in detention. So, um, yeah, I think with all of this, you know, it is a whole notion of othering. So we go back to the, the first premise, how are other cultures, other community groups being treated? We need to really look at, is that the type of society that we're wanting to have? And is that an inclusive society? So one of the, given that we have so much data gaps, one of the projects that I did in Victoria was um, with the China Family Welfare uh, Centre down there, we actually looked at, um, let's capture the data from the NGO sector, all of those uh, community service organisations that were funded for out-of-home care placements. So over a three-month period, we um, did a survey, just asking them, what are the, what's the cultural mix of the children and young people in your placements? And so out of the 19 agencies that responded to that survey, which was a total of 2,053, approximately 20% of the total, so in Victoria their total is about 6,500 children in care. This graph will be a bit more interesting. That was the mix. So 74% Anglo-Australian, 12% Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, 14% Cald and refugee young people. So that's actually more than Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, or on par. So if we actually try to think about our understanding about overrepresentation, what does that mean? And that's why it's absolutely critical to have data. Now, in, in two of the NGOs, when I looked at the data and I drilled down into their data, the regions that had the highest diversity, which was the Northwestern region and then the Dandenong region, had up to 20% of the children and young people in out of home care from a CALD or a refugee background. That speaks volumes. 20%. And yet, no training, no policy, no understanding, and no real way of how do we actually meet the need of this 20%. Um, in New South Wales, when they did the audit in 2007, their figures was 15% of children and young people in out-of-home care that could speak a language other than English, but that is historical. Cultural practice skills. So this is the third element. So this is really drills down to what do practitioners need to do to change and be responsive and sensitive. So it's about how do you build rapport? How do you engage? Critical first part is actually identifying what the family's background is. You know, asking them the, the questions. Who are you? Where are you from? Where did you come from? How long have you been in Australia? What's your journey? It's not rocket science. It's not hard. It's about empathy. It's about being with your client. It's also about being curious and actually being sensitive, that I'm going to take the time to understand the client that's sitting in front of me. Being respectful, being self-aware. You know, whether you're working with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islands or whether you're working with Pacific Islanders or Indians or Asians, it's about, you know, are you doing anything that might be offensive? Trying to understand the client, trying to understand some of the norms and the practices. You know, is it appropriate for me to shake their hand? Is it appropriate to do eye contact? You know? 
Um, and you know, trying to look at the power differentials in the dynamic. You know, would they like a support person? You know, do they need to have an interpreter? These are all critical skills that practitioners, whether you're in frontline, policy, program, NGO sector, that you should be having, should be practicing on a daily basis. So, I absolutely love this. So I've, I've, had, I've been lucky enough to have met Lisa Fontes when she came to Australia a couple of years back. Uh, and we're all familiar with Brofenburg's um, ecological uh, model. So she, she proposed to have a third circle, which is ethnic culture. Okay? And the reason why she said to include ethnic culture, it allows practitioners to consider different ways of working with the child individually, the child's family through kinship, understanding religion, community, cultural leaders, and child in school and the institutional impact. So if we're working in a holistic framework, in an ecological framework, that is how we need to include that. Now I've used that framework and I've unpacked it further in, in developing this practice guide. So understanding ethnic culture. So in developing this, and this is from consulting with various um, community groups, but also drawing on the research and literature, was that what are the critical factors of ethnic culture? So that was the family of origin, the values and belief systems. So what does a family value? You know, what are their core beliefs? You know, whether it's around raising their children. Do they have particular beliefs for boys and girls? You know, values around dating or values around schooling. What's their cultural identity and belonging? What do they, what, how is that important to them? What is it they want to maintain? If they have a different religion or a spiritual framework, what is that? And what does that mean for them? And that's tied into morals and ethics and values. If they have traditional foods or cooking, you know, how do they want to maintain that and, and keep that? Cultural traditions and customs. You know, whether they celebrate cultural festivals or they wear a certain dress, you know, or they have totems or folklore, and language or, or maintaining bilingual children. Now, the outside circle are the multiple factors that can influence ethnic culture. So whether you're a migrant or a refugee family coming to Australia, you're going to be impacted by those factors. And that includes your migration journey, and the settlement experience in Australia, the acculturation process and adjusting to a new host culture. The third category is government institutions, that's legislation, policy and practice. And the fourth one is racism and discrimination in a new country and how the media portrays different community groups. The media is a powerful player. And we're already seeing that, and, and, and it annoys me when I, every time I look at the Australian and this huge discourse now that it seems to be every time the Australian is pushing this notion of jihadist, that we're, you know, we've got this huge national security issue around you know, the Muslims that we're creating, and we need, to, we need to do something about it. We are stigmatizing a, a community group. We are labeling a community group, a religious group, as terrorists, which was done 10 years ago during the Iraq war or the Afghan war, okay? And we've got to understand what are those messages tells our clients. So when you're working with a Muslim client, what does that tell them? Well, how does that make them feel when they're constantly being labelled as a terrorist or, or as a person who, you know, is not sensitive or not caring towards their family or their wives or their children? So the media and the government institutions play a powerful role in how communities integrate and feel welcome and be part of this society and community. So, last but not least, culturally sensitive practice guide. We're here. <laughs> um, look, it's very exciting. Very exciting to have been working on this and developing this. So it's it's, and it's come about from a space of. A lot of practitioners, you know, were asking me, you know, it's all well and good. They attended the training and they said, we need something more, okay? We don't know. We get stuck when we're having conversations. So whether they were working in foster care agencies or whether they're working in frontline, they were really struggling in how to 
engage and how to ask those questions and how to work in culturally sensitive ways. So this practice guide is driven by practice. So it's been like an action research project where you know it's been guided by practitioners using the research, using the evidence, but also a practical tool to help people in being more culturally responsive. Now, it would not have been possible, I, as much as I say I can do everything, I can't do everything, uh, without having um, some critical partners in, in developing this practice guide. And I'm really grateful for um, three NGOs that came on board on this project, which was Life Without Barriers, Key Assets and Peak Care Queensland, who were the funding partners to this project. The project started back in December last year and was completed by July this year, so I have been waiting two months to launch it. <laughs> but we're here now, so, we, we, you know, so it's been very exciting. We also had a project reference group, so I wanted to also acknowledge all the people that have been part of this project and who have inputted into it. So that was Steve Jacks, Rob Ryan, Brad Swan, Mary McKinnon, Lindsay Wagner, Biljana Milosevic from Janui, um, that's in New South Wales, um, staff at CREATE, Queensland branch, and I also have a young person, staff at Life Without Barriers, staff at Key Assets. It was also peer reviewed by Dr. Pooja Swaraka and also um, a dear colleague of mine, um, Mr. Andy Haslam, who's also a manager down in New South Wales Docks. He was also my first team leader in child protection in Queensland too, so we've kept a long history and connections. Um, I also want to acknowledge Craig Burns, who was a graphics designer um, who's been working with me quite closely in developing the guide and, and you know, got the vision and the images and the layout perfect, so that was great. So, there's some critical things about the purpose of the practice guide. As of when I looked at what was available out there, nothing like this exists in Australia or even overseas. So if you were to do a Google search about you know, trying to find a practice guide or uh, some policy framework around how to support ethnic minority children and young people, you might find a technical paper, but a practical guide that explains how to support cultural diversity, um, ethnic culture, you won't find it. So this, so this is quite innovative and cutting edge and, and very exciting. So it's supposed to help anyone in the sector. So whether you're uh, child protection, out of home care, foster carer, kinship carer, policy program officer, understand culturally sensitive practice. So I don't want to hear any excuses now. I don't know what culturally sensitive practice is. Here you go. Here's a guide. Pleasure for reading. Um, it's there to improve service planning for cowed and refugee children and young people in out-of-home care. So given that we don't know how many cowed or refugee children and young people are in the care system, if you are working with a, a child or a young pe person that is from a cowed or refugee background, this guide is there for, for you to help, to support that child, and that young person. It's also to help improve cultural support planning. So the National Out-of-Home Care Standards has um, a, a, um, a standard for, which is mandatory for all states and territories to develop cultural support plans for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. That has not transferred over to children from CALD or refugee backgrounds. It is proposed as an action item, but it has not been mandated. So there is no excuse. You have a guide here. So outside of a legislative or a departmental requirement, you have a practice guide here to improve your practice and service provision. And as an accompaniment to the practice guide, um, the fact that there was no training, I have developed two training workshops which are endorsed by the Australian Association of Social Workers for CPD, which you know, is about building capacity, building the knowledge and building the evidence base and improving and enhancing outcomes for children and young people from cowed and diverse backgrounds. So, last but not a few, we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the stories that are in here. In developing the practice guide, I, obviously because I've been passionate about this space, I have met a number of cowed and refugee young people that have been in care and have a care experience. So Yusuf was the first one that I met uh, a few years back, and he's also um, been part of SBS Insight. So the Google link is there at the bottom, so you can actually view that, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, so he was um, 
you know, he, he's from a Lebanese Muslim background. He was about 10 when he came into care. And he's been doing a lot of advocacy in raising the profile needs of migrant young people in care. Um, he was never placed with Muslim foster carers. He was placed with Anglo-Australian foster carers. Um, initially, he was placed with his siblings, but then um, following subsequent uh, placement changes, he wasn't placed with his siblings. And if you have a look at the episode on SBS, he really struggled. So when he left care and tried to find his siblings, you know, um, it was really hard because there was no connection there. There was no history. So he, he was really cut up when his sister said to me, I don't know you. Zina, Zina is a young person that was from a Congolese background. Now, the critical thing that she identified was that she actually experienced a lot of racism um, in, in her placement. So she actually had an experience of being in a residential care facility and um, the other girls who were from white Australian background actually wrote on her door, go back to your own country, bitch. And um, she was really hurt by that. And she complained to the workers, the, the resi workers, um, and they didn't do anything. So that really cut her up. And, and I'll just use her quote, because I didn't put it up on there. Um, it, she stated, it's a shame for a kid being in care. I feel out of place. Being the only kid in care from that country, Congo, they don't provide cultural support for kids like me. And that was quite poignant. She felt like she was not counted, she didn't matter. Um, and her story, her journey, didn't matter to anyone. Sion is a young person from a Samoan background and a care leaver as well, so Pacific Islander background. And, you know, the challenges for him when he came into care was that he had a very strong uh, Christian uh, background too and um, he wanted to maintain his connections to, with the Samoan church but he wasn't placed with um, a Samoan carers. He wasn't um, connected or had access to connection to being able to go to the Samoan church. And as time progressed, he became really, really isolated. So his trajectory actually led to homelessness. So this case study actually came from a homelessness service and um, some chronic mental illnesses as well. So he had that as, as an after effect, or I guess the outcome of being in a care system, no connection to um, community, no connection to um, the church, or that, that was so important to him that he felt really isolated and vulnerable. And Bashir is a young person that was from an Afghani Hazara background. Um, this one, this was a story from Shepparton, um, just around, you know, I guess sharing his journey about how he came to Australia, um, I guess through the asylum seeker process, and then being placed into the unaccompanied minors program, and and how that program used to be able to facilitate and support unaccompanied minors, and and how they helped them through his adjustment to Australia. All right, last but not least. So the practice guide unpacks what is culturally sensitive practice. It also has four aspects where you actually get to know and do what is a cultural support plan for a child from a CALD or refugee background. So there are four different attachments which you can download from the website. So in your bags, um, you've got a flyer in there which has a web link. So it's live, it's ready, you can download it. I just hope the, the website doesn't crash on me. <laughs> but um, with the different downloadable attachments, it is meant to be used as a practical way. So you can print them off and actually have that conversation with the child or younger person. So it's about finding out what's important to them and understanding what aspects they want to maintain and what you need to do to connect them to the different aspects of ethnic culture. Ways forward, key home messages. What I'd like you to leave with and go with back to your agencies or departments is we need to collect data. It's absolutely essential. You cannot have a system or a government service provision which only looks at Anglo-Australian and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. We've got to move beyond that. We are a multicultural society. 20% of your population is from a diverse background. It's not on. And, I, and I'm tired of hearing the, the complacency and um, the reluctance to capture the data. There's a real need for research to be undertaken which examines the needs of placement of 
migrant and refugee young people in out of home care. Okay, so anyone who's interested in research or looking at a PhD, go for it. That's a huge topic area to look into. The National Child Protection Framework, you know, really needs to start to look at how, what are the cultural provisions in there. You know, when one in four Australians are born overseas, we can't ignore that whole demographic group. We need to look at how we're recruiting, retaining and supporting carers who do have children and young people from diverse backgrounds, refugee backgrounds placed with them and how we're providing that training and support to them and how we're educating them. We need to look at how we're developing our cultural support plans. So as I alluded before, um, there is a real need to actually change our practice and improve our practice. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> when one in four Australians are born overseas, we can't ignore that whole demographic group. We need to look at how we're recruiting, retaining and supporting carers who do have children and young people from diverse backgrounds, refugee backgrounds placed with them and how we're providing that training and support to them and how we're educating them. We need to look at how we're developing our cultural support plans. So as I alluded before, um, there is a real need to actually change our practice and improve our practice. That's it, I'm done. <laughs>